Hey dudes and dudettes, Hardcore Kid here, and uh, happy Hardcore Halloween season to all you guys. And, uh, well, I've decided to put together a special review, just for you guys. A very, very special review. Do you guys happen to remember that fucked up CGI movie, Where the Dead Go to Die? Yeah that movie. Well, the creator, Jimmy Screamer Claus, he made another one. In 2012, a pothead by the name of Jimmy Screamer Claus gained recognition with the release of his Cinema 4D anthology film, Where the Dead Go to Die, a hideously animated mindfuck consisting of shit CGI, non-existent story, sex, blood, gore, and brain rape. On top of that, Screamer Claus admitted he was high as a kite putting the thing together, which tells you all you need to know about his style. When I did my review in 2013, I gave it a positive review, or in this case a hardcore Screamer Claus rating, because I thought it was such a hardcore film. <laughs> I was joking. All right, you want to know my real thoughts on it? It's a big steaming pile of dog shit, all right? I mean, you have to be as fucked up in the head as Jimmy was to even think that this movie was good. And you know what the sad thing is? There are actually people out there who actually praise this film, thinking that it's deep and edgy. Oh, yeah, there's plenty of edge to it, all right. The edge of insanity. The edge of the toilet seat. The edge of your cerebellum that makes you think, what the fuck is this shit? But apparently, Screamer Claus took my review to heart, which prompted him to make another shock horror movie a few months ago entitled When Blackbirds Fly. It uses the same shit CGI as WTDGTD did, and I'm pretty sure Jimmy was just as fucked up when he was putting this thing together as he did when he made his last movie. So if you enjoyed destroying your brain cells with Jimmy's last masterpiece, then get ready for another dose of brain freeze as we review When Blackbirds Fly. Roll the footage. Huh, this is different. This animation doesn't look too bad. We get some stop motion of a couple of blackbirds flying in front of some old school grainy footage thrown in. Of course, that all goes out the window when you finally see the CG, which features some awkwardly animated blackbirds, as well as this guy wearing glasses three times too big for his head. Boy, after Alvin and the Chipmunks, you'd think David Cross would have tried to turn his career around. Anyway, this is Daryl. He and his wife Norma live in what looks like Pleasantville, but is actually referred to as Heaven. A calm, peaceful suburb where everything is black and white and dull, and everybody has pictures of Marshall Applewhite as wallpaper. Somehow I imagine the people who saw the test screenings for this thing committed suicide as soon as it was over. Maybe that's why there's not that many reviews for it. They didn't live to tell about it. So as Daryl and Norma are tending to an injured bird, a preacher, who I'm going to refer to as Black Pope, shows up on their doorstep to have the couple adopt a child. Is this the home of Citizen Daryl and Citizen Norma? Yes, sirree. The two of you have been living in heaven for 20 years now, correct? Yes, sir. Well, congratulations, sir. Today is your lucky day. Your application for one child so has been approved. So if you and your wife would like to join me, we have prepared a vehicle to go to the Berlin Center right now! By the way, the voice actor for Black Pope is white. I may have mocked fake accents in the past, but a white guy voicing a black guy? Now that's racist. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you! I double dare you, motherfucker! So check this shit out. In this community, sex has been forbidden. So, how the hell do our heroes reproduce? Well, they go to some tripped out church where they're fed forbidden fruit, and then Daryl cuts the inside of his mouth and vomits blood into a goblet, and then Norma shoves the blade in her cooch and bleeds all over the place, and they give the blood to this weird sperm looking thing, which eventually transfigures it into a human child. 
If drugs and candy were not responsible for this writing, then Dinesh D'Souza was the world's greatest filmmaker. Even I think Hillary's America was made under the influence of an illegal substance. Perhaps Twizzlers. So they named the boy Marius, and they raised like him as they would any newborn, teaching him to speak, proper etiquette, and dressing him up like a long-lost Ramon. Oh, and they constantly, and I mean constantly, tell him about the wondrous leader known as Cain. They watch some shitty TV show which has him kick the shit out of some she-monster known as the Evil One. And they even send him to a school where he's taught faith of Cain. The Evil One and all her lies dwell behind that wall. Our Lord Cain built the wall to keep her out forever. You see, Cain and the Evil One were once a team. They built and founded heaven together. But our humble Lord Cain just couldn't tolerate her deceitful ways anymore. She wanted to use and exploit us. So Cain did what he had to do. He did it for us. He cast her out, that filth, so that we may live here in peace. Let us all thank Cain. The God's Not Dead movies have certainly dropped in quality, haven't they? Okay, son. Put him down. Ah, ah. <gasps> Look at him fly! You see, son, all life in heaven is equal. One creature is not more important than the other. We're all alive and therefore we're all loved by God. And God's love is unconditional. So if you see one of God's creatures in danger, it's your duty to help it. Then, someday, it might help you back. Do you understand what I mean, Marius? As you can tell, Daryl is quite the religious person. If you thought Ned Flanders was a God-loving saint, Daryl is the knight to the throne. He's so religious, he makes Kirk Cameron look atheist. And unfortunately, Daryl's religious beliefs are what also make him, well, crazy. I myself happen to be a Christian, but I do have to admit that there have been some religious nut jobs who are so into their tradition that they come up with the most ridiculous claims. Remember that guy from years ago, Estes Perkel? Remember he made that communist scare film where if you're an atheist and you don't turn to Christianity, you get murdered by commie soldiers? That's the kind of mentality that Daryl and just about everyone else in this movie has. Will you come? Will you come? Will you come? Eventually, Marius does learn to talk. His voice sounds like a demented Spike the Dragon on helium. That's it! Look, right there! Right there! You didn't see it? Go see for yourself! Are you sure it's a good idea to go on the other side of the wall, Ian? I was just wondering, um... Can animals talk? By the way, I did check the credits at the end, and he is in fact voiced by a kid. And, uh, apparently that kid is Joseph8276. He may be a creepy stalker with low standards, but he's still the beast! Also at the school, he meets his love interest, Eden. How nice of you to join us. Sorry, Mr. Apple, I'm not as good as you, I never will be. And given Jimmy's, um, treatment of children in his films, you know these two are going to have a very long, happy future together. Also, death by snafu. So with Marius fed up with people not shutting up about Cain, he follows a blackbird through the woods until he comes across a wall. As it's mentioned, heaven is closed off from the outside world with giant walls separating them. This is to protect the town from the evil one. So basically, it's like Attack on Titan, where the heroes are isolated from the rest of the world, and the penis is rendered ambiguous. But Marius discovers a hole in the wall, and the land of black and white is illuminated by color and the image of an injured cat. Marius finds Eden, who tries to help. Who's there? Somebody? Hey! Hey there! My name's Eden! Are you alright? Please! I'm in a lot of pain! I fell off the wall and broke my leg! Please come and save me before the evil one gets me! Please! We need a helper! No! No! What? What? No! We can't! We can't! She'll get us! We just have to be quick! Are you kids? Get away from there! Shit, boss! Where did this all come? 
Jesus Christ, Jimmy. It's bad enough I have to crank the volume all the way down to two bars, but is this really the kind of voices you're going to give these things? These fuckers in the gas masks are Kane's special forces. They're the equivalent of the stormtroopers from Star Wars and the Terminator, in which they wear gas masks for no discernible reason, shoot at every fucking thing that moves, and have the worst fucking voices ever known to man. What are these things supposed to be, anyway? Malfunctioning astro zombies from Uranus? Why the gas masks? Anyway, fuck these guys. Marius and Eden decide to go back to the wall to help the kitten, only to be chased by those fucking guards again. They escape into the other world and run right into the cat. And by invisible, I mean shit-faced. So the fruit causes the cat to turn into Boggy, monster of mighty ganja, who then summons a flock of birds to murder the guards a la George Stark. This scene would actually be quite satisfying. If it didn't sound like this. Two bars. I swear. Two fucking bars. I'm this close to making it one. If it was three, you guys would be deaf immediately. Just... Why? Why even? Why bother? Why? So the kids follow the pussy from hell through rainbow bright land until they find the evil one, crucified and being raped by tentacle monsters. I'm chilling out here. I'm trying to find my way back into the garden. A long time ago, God was a misfit. Unfortunately, he and Danzig didn't get along. Now, the website does refer to her as the evil one, but I'm just going to call her Cortana. That's really the first thing that comes to mind when I see this Honolulu. So she tells the kids about how she and this world came to be, and how she's not from around here. She's from another dimension! She was delicate and sweet. You was gaze upon her once. And for the rest of your life, she'd be the one that emerges from the darkness whenever you close your eyes. Oh, she was more beautiful than God. God learned something he never knew about before. Heartbreak. Well, if you're going to commit the sin of being a non-monogamous whore, I'm sure God would be pretty pissed off at you. And if you ever wanted to see God beat the shit out of people, then this movie is for you. But you know, I gotta admit, I'm actually astonished here. Jimmy is doing what he was unable to do in his last film and actually give a character depth. He's actually trying to make us care about Cortana and the shit she had to go through. From being raped, to being abandoned by God, to getting impregnated by 8,000 sperm worms, yeah, it's fucked up bullshit, but at least Screamer Claus is actually trying to make us show that she is in fact not evil and try to make us care about her. However, this also leads to a couple of problems. Number one, this scene is long. It legit goes on for a good ten minutes. That's about as long as most Naruto flashbacks. And you want to know how long this movie is? Two hours and four minutes. Yeah. I've seen Pixar movies that were not this long, and if Jimmy had actually attempted to trim down some of this shit, it wouldn't be this long. But no, he was so high off his ass, he just had to keep throwing as much shit in as possible. Speaking of, after giving birth to all those slug baby things, Cortana is now given the task of raising them. And that includes a scene where we see a bunch of naked children dancing around. Fuck's sake, Jimmy, what are you trying to accomplish with this garbage? No, no, don't tell me you're trying to make it shocking, because it sure as fuck isn't. It's just showing that you have a massive boner for rendering this shit. 
Who the hell is this supposed to be aimed at? And to think that the first 20 minutes of this movie were actually watchable. So it's basically established that the cat is the real evil one. So Marius and Eden try to get the hell out of Dodge, but then another creature appears and kidnaps Eden. Marius manages to escape, and the police bring him back home. I'm very disappointed in you, son. How many times have I told you to not accidentally fall out of your window in the middle of the night and get into some late night romantic adventure with the girl down the street that involves you out running the Oswald Evil Prevention Squad? There was an attack by the Evil One's minions a little while ago. Don't you know we're at an Evil Alert level magenta blue green circle square star? Just keep him away from the windows until he learns how to sleep a little bit better. Oh, you bet we will. Son, no windows for a month. No, that's not fair. All right, how about a week? Are you even a real person? But just as Marius is about to head to bed, he vomits up one of the demons, which snowballs straight into Norma's mouth. Oh no, what's going to happen next? Well, you're going to have to find out in the next part, so stay tuned and beware. If you think this shit is messed up, just wait. It's about to get a whole lot worse. Dudes, I hope you enjoyed my shit posting of two dozen BattleBots videos from last weekend. Because now, we can go back and finish watching Jimmy Screamer Claus's masterpiece, When Blackbirds Fly. So let's take our broken wings and fly away from this. Didn't I have more hair when I started? Back in David Lynch land, Marius is now back in school, but Eden has not returned. It's revealed that she's been kidnapped in the other world, sliced open, and being transformed into a Cenobite. So, yeah, she's dead. And her captor? Some mutilated mess of pixels with a bunch of eyes for a face. It even has eyes for nipples. Twenty eyes in my head, twenty eyes in my head, twenty eyes in my head, they're all the same, they're on her tits! So, uh, is this Catwoman's evil minion or something? I honestly can't tell because her voice is so fucking distorted amongst all the bad audio that she's barely intelligible. And just when you thought the animation couldn't possibly get any worse, the film just starts glitching out. No, I'm not kidding. When I saw this, I thought something was wrong with my computer. Like it was buffering or something. But no, this is really how Jimmy rendered this. Seriously, man, what the fuck is wrong with you? You have a naked underage Harukiri girl running around, voice acting that sounds like it was recorded inside a blender, and animation that looks like it came from a Matthew Davis video. What in your fucked up mind told you that any of this was good? So Eden is transformed into some demented zombie bunny, and Senora Tit Eyes carries her to Marius' house. Um, where the fuck are the guards? Given how protected this place is, I doubt this thing would be able to walk all the way from the hole to Marius' house completely undetected. Also, for whatever reason, in different shots, Eden keeps turning into either a bunny or a bunny zombie. Is this supposed to be a disguise? Or is Jimmy just inconsistent? Why do I even ask? So Eden is given the task of killing Marius. And she doesn't. Ineffective Cenobite. But remember that demon worm that Norma swallowed before? Well, now it's going full-blown heavy metal on her and causes her to transform into... <laughs> 
Nah, I'm just kidding. This is a picture of Demon Bailey, signed by Bailey herself. <laughs> now, instead what we get is something extremely stupid. Norma rips off her dress, exposing her tits, and then the abomination starts popping out of her vagina like a jack-in-the-box. Quick! Call Lappy and tell him the demon baby has respawned! Dad, why are you helping Mom? What's going on? You don't understand, Marius. Couples, they don't... They don't see each other without their clothes on. What? Why? It's one of the rules. Jeez, what are they teaching you in these schools? But we can't just let her suffer in there, Dad! It's heaven, son. There's no suffering in heaven. Uh, fuck you, you retarded Jesus freak! Your wife is in there possibly dying, and you won't go in there to help her because it's against the rules? Dude, fuck your fake-ass religion and call an ambulance or something! <laughs> Dad, it's Mom! We have to do something! How about some ice cream? So check it out. I got roasted marshmallow ice cream with graham cracker bits and Oreo cookie bits on top mixed in with chocolate syrup. This stuff is so bad for me, but damn it, is it good. But help comes, believe it or not, in the form of a blackbird. All better? Good sir, could you possibly spare some bread for a bird down on his lap? Marius? That wasn't hey, funny. Hey! Down here! What hey. the f... Take a look down, good man. You can talk? Of course I can. Didn't they teach you anything in school, sir? No. Well, I mean, maybe I... Hey, relax, no big deal. Maybe they just forgot. I mean, they forgot to teach your son about the thing with the naked ladies. Okay, I'm gonna be serious right now. This bird is the best character in this entire movie. For two good reasons. One, he's voiced by David Firth, who is both the creator and the voice actor for Salad Fingers. Now ain't that a blast from the past. Also, his character, who's called Corvus, by the way, is basically playing the calm, sarcastic Ricky Gervais role where he says, Oh, everything's fine. Your wife is just giving birth to a beautiful demon abomination. But we can take care of it. Hmm, yes, sir. Everything seems to be in order here. So Marius goes to get help, but everyone in this town is so brainwashed by Cain that they refuse to listen. Suddenly, Eden shows up trying to murder Marius, and this finally gets their attention. Zombie girlfriend, but my mom is naked. But despite their best efforts, the Eden monster vomits up a bunch of those worms and infects some of the Kane supporters. Oh, 
Let this be a lesson to all you filthy, disgusting atheists. If you don't support religion, expect yourself to be shot on sight. Holy shit. This is an Estes Perkel film! to worry about police officers using unnecessary deadly force because we'd all be dead! Meanwhile, Corvus instructs Daryl on how to get the demon out of Norma's stomach. So he... Uh, tells him to get naked and fuck her, I guess. Well shit, no wonder men can't reproduce. They all have Ken doll syndrome! So after a good, uh... Shagging, Daryl manages to get the demon out of Norma's wound. <laughs> All this carnage, and you just had to throw in a boing sound effect? Oh, this movie is so stupid. So Daryl and Corvus catch the demon and carry it to the other world, leaving Norma bleeding profusely on the floor. Douche. You know the door was open! Chief, break everything! Is that you? Have you come for me? Have you come back? Is the waiting over? Man, we found your son wandering the streets, muttering something about his mother walking around with no clothes on in the privacy of her own home, which is an offense punishable by exile. Is this true? I met God tonight. Sir, the boy's mother has an exit wound between her legs. How shall we proceed? Right, citizen Norma, due to high treason, your right to exist in this world has been revoked. Prepare to be evacuated. So not only do they not allow sex and have a trigger-happy police force, but they don't even have medical services? Heaven sucks. Are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You never know. Protect and serve Cain, bitch. So the police bring Marius to the control center to speak to Cain. At last, we can now answer the question, who is this Cain? The demon Cain? Poltergeist Cain? This butthead? No. It's just some Robert Downey Jr. looking schmuck. Disappointing! Could you? This world that I've provided for you isn't enough. You still had to go crawling back to her. I, I don't understand. I understand the allure she can have. But do you know what? She will turn on you, Marius. She will guide you down the wrong path. And then she will turn on you. You know, since you have come in here, you haven't praised me once. Maybe it's because you're a sanctimonious tool who built a religion and a community based entirely around yourself? Just saying. Kane then reveals that both he and Cortana used to be lovers. 
And he describes their relationship in another long, long, long flashback scene. I could just lay here and talk to you all night long. I feel so safe with you. Like nothing bad could ever happen. <laughs> this movie is two hours long. Two hours long, bitch. One by one, they all found their way to the top of the hill that day, partaking in every pleasure that this place had to offer. She just opens up her legs, and she radiates a brand new set of colors that nobody's ever known before. Then you fall in love with her when you realize that the others only project the colors that you have already seen. Okay, to abridge this whole thing, Cain and Cortana find forbidden fruit. They share it with the other humans. Cain gets jealous and wants fruit too. He can't get any because fuck you, well, that's why. Fat ugly guy who I'm pretty sure is Corvus, he's also voiced by David Firth, eats all the fruit and rapes Cortana with his fat tumor dick. This causes a chain reaction where everyone is raping Cortana. This causes random fire and explosions and death galore. Cortana is crucified. Cain and some survivors decide to create a safe haven which would be known as Heaven. The Great Wall was built and now Donald Tri I mean, Cain is the Overlord. Woo! There, I just saved you ten minutes worth of bullshit. So, basically Cortana is evil because she got raped? Yeah. Victim blaming is the main reason for all this death and destruction. Does any of this make any sense to you? Because it sure as hell doesn't to me. If anything, it kind of makes Kane look like the villain. Like, he couldn't step in and try to stop all this insanity? But I didn't listen. I knew what they were up to, and I didn't listen. So now that he's heard both Cortana and Kane's stories, what does Marius do? The answer is nothing. He doesn't try to tie things together, he doesn't come up with any solutions to their issues, he just stands there listening to Kane's story. This kid is the only level-headed character in this entire movie. Why aren't you doing anything with him? And besides, besides being the founder of Heaven, what else has Kane actually done for his people aside from building the Great Wall? He's a sanctimonious jackass who brainwashes everyone into believing he's the second coming of God. And he's even murdered a bunch of innocent people, all because they didn't support him. Why do people consider him a hero? What good has he been doing for these inhabitants? And why the hell is Eden back? just murdered our main protagonist. Fuck you, Jimmy Screamer Claus. Just fuck you. As for Daryl, Corvus leads him to the other world where he has to kill the baby in front of Cortana's minions. We are the minions of an ancient people who chose the path of the life giver instead of the sky monster. What do you want from me? 
So that I will never be alone. We start up right now. I love you, the Almighty King. Something Should I ever find myself lost in the shadow of the beast? Then yeah. grant me the ability to see through the darkness and find your path I again. Say, my Just hurry up and kill it before my speakers explode. Sorry, Daryl, but the 1981 Clash of the Titans was far superior. Hail Kane! Hail Kane! Hail Kane! Hail the man who murdered my family! Hail Kane! Hail Kane! Okay, you can shut the fuck up now. Shut the fuck up! Shut the fuck up! Stop being a fucking cunt! Shut the fuck up! Nobody even wants you here! When a movie is so bad that you're forced to use a filthy Frank meme as a cutaway joke, that's when you know you've completely given up. And here's the moment you are waiting to arise. The ending. In the explosion, all the monsters are killed, including Daryl. Though, given how much of a dumbass he was throughout this whole thing, he kind of deserved it. Cortana, who somehow is still alive, is stuck in Semen World, living for all eternity. While back on Heaven, a portal suddenly opens up, and Cain, as well as what's left of Heaven's population, are sent up to God to live a new life. Oh, good for them, huh? I mean, too bad we couldn't save any of the characters that mattered, am I right? What the hell kind of ending was this? All of our protagonists are dead, Cain is a filthy murderer who has now aligned himself with God, and Cortana is forever alone. I know I shouldn't always harp on film length, but after two hours of bullshit, this was the best conclusion you could come up with? Well, I guess Jimmy decided a bit too late that it did suck, so the post-credits contain a bunch of alternate scenes and semi-endings, including one where it's revealed that the whole thing was really a propaganda film set up by Daryl Norma and Black Pope. Wait, Black Pope? Where the hell have you been, you geek? You are taking a chance on your soul for eternity. Cain needs soldiers for his army. We need to fight the evil one every way we can. Whether it's joining the Oswald Evil Protection Squad or teaching your children the dangers of asking too many questions. So they do not end up like the kids you saw in the film tonight. And also so you don't end up like their parents. Excuse me, Egon. But you just showed Cain murder a bunch of people for not supporting him. Why the fuck would any sane person support him after that garbage? Oh yeah, I forgot. Nobody in this world is sane. And if this is a propaganda film, why would you make the evil one out to be such a baby face? I think that TV show did a better job of portraying her as evil than you did. Can I get a hail, Cain? Uh, how about we get a hail no? Fuck you, shut up, this movie sucks. Now to be fair, it is better than Where the Dead Go to Die. This one at least has some kind of structure. The first act is surprisingly watchable, but once Jimmy starts getting all of his shit in, it once again becomes an absolute pain to watch. On top of the obviously crap animation, everyone in this movie is a moron. Daryl is a cane, white knighting idiot, Cortana is way too likable to be considered evil, and Kane is an egregious liar and a douchebag. Why are we supposed to care about these characters when their motives don't make any sense? 
Hell, nothing in this movie makes any sense. The best character is still Corvus because of his dry, sarcastic humor and not-give-a-fuck attitude while all this crap is going on. The kids are... there. They're slightly better actors than whatever the hell we got in the last film, but given that they keep building up their roles only to lead them to their eventual demise, just makes their roles entirely pointless. Damn it, Jimmy, I was this close to giving this movie a thumbs up, but your coked up mind just couldn't handle it. So a hardcore headache to this movie, oh, and a hardcore tumor for where the dead go to die. Now if you excuse me, I'm going to go watch Ash vs. Evil Dead. Maybe Bruce Campbell murdering demons will put a more positive perspective on my life. Hail Bruce! Hail Bruce! Hail Bruce! Hail! Alright, I'm done. Peace out and happy Halloween. What's that? Cleveland Brown's voice actor is white? Oh. Uh...